My name is Venkatesh Rao, and uh, uh, it's kind of complicated to introduce myself, so you can go to my uh, website. I'm basically a blogger and a couple of other things. And uh, I promise you this is the only meme I'll throw at you. Uh, so I do write a blog, uh, newsletter, and so on. And this is going to be a pretty abstract talk um, at a fairly high level. Uh, but I do have like at least some experience dabbling at a very hands-on beginner level. So I'm coming from somewhere, as in it's not up in the cloud. So if you're interested, I did a long thread uh, last year about uh, my initial explorations of Web3 stuff. Okay, so the title of my talk, There Are Many Alternatives, it's a reference to Margaret Thatcher's famous line, There Is No Alternative. She popularized it, I think, starting in 1980. And it became the catchphrase of uh, neoliberalism. And the basic idea was that as communism was beginning to get discredited, there was increasingly no alternative to the idea of Western liberal democratic uh, ways of running countries with free markets and the institutions that came with it. And it became sort of the um, core of what became known as the Washington Consensus. So for those of you who need the short history lesson, um, this was a consensus before blockchain type consensuses. And this was the set of practices that the World Bank and uh, IMF used to sort of dictate to countries how they should run their economies. And this was around 1989. And as the uh, Cold War ended, the thesis became more than an economic thesis and it leveled up into a sort of philosophical historical thesis. And one of the things that really helped this along was this book that came out in 91 called um, The End of History and the Last Man. And it's widely misunderstood, but it became sort of a justification for the idea that there is no alternative to the one way to run the world. And of course, uh, as many of you remember, a lot of people were very unhappy with the idea of there is a one single playbook of how to run the world. And I think of them as alt-teeners. As in, they don't really want a pluralist world with many systems competing on how to run it, but they want to be the default alternative. They want to be the way to run the world to which there is no alternative. And some of them are kind of like lost to history now, but uh, some of you may remember the anti-globalization protests and the World Social Forum that came up in the late 90s. Islamic terror was another sort of alternate way of running the world in, in the making. Uh, what we now think of as sovereign individualism type libertarianism, the original book actually came out in the late 90s before um, blockchain stuff. And of course, uh, the Chinese model and uh, Deng's model of running an alternate to the Western model came up around then. So I define a Tina or a there is no alternative theory as a kind of maxi thesis. It's the idea that one winner take all convergent future will dominate the rest of history. And again, uh, is Bruno Maceas in this crowd? So you should attend his talk since he's written uh, a book called History, History's Beginning, and I'm sure he has more to say about it. But I think a lot of the use of Fukuyama's ideas in the sort of there is no alternative kind of theorizing is basically wrong. But okay, let's start the story for this uh, talk with Bitcoin. And I think of Bitcoin as the alt libertarian Tina playbook with extra steps. So I don't have much more to say about Bitcoin. But Ethereum, I think, is not a Tina theory, right? It seems to enable many divergent stories, even within itself and in its relationships to other things, right? So within the Ethereum universe, you've got artists with their NFTs, you've got DeFi degens like going for yield farming. And these are very, very different types of people. They're not like you know, when you talk to Bitcoin maxis, you expect them to be eating beef, reading the same books, and sort of spouting the same ideology. When you talk to Ethereum uh, people, if you picked one at random, you have no idea what you'll get. You could get like a far left person into art. You could get a far right person who's kind of like indistinguishable from Bitcoiners. So that's what you get with Ethereum. And it seems to coexist well with things outside Ethereum as well, like, you know, the traditional uh, legal system. It has ways of like inter interoperating with them and so forth. <clears throat> 
Okay, let's give that property a name. I'm going to call it hypercomplexity. It's the property of a system that allows it to sustain many mutually incommensurate divergent narrative futures at the same time. I wanted to read it out at least once. And by mutually incommensurate, that's kind of a quasi-mathematical uh, way of saying it, but it means you cannot judge one story by another story. You cannot judge whether Lord of the Rings is a good story based on whether you like Harry Potter or not, because they have different aesthetics, they have different narrative logics, right? So why hyper instead of you know, all the other prefixes? And I think that's worth a note. Uh, lots of other things call themselves hyper. Uh, all are interesting to look into. Timothy Martin's hyper objects, climate change is an example. Adam Curtis's hyper normalization is sort of the opposite of what I'm talking about right now. Uh, Nick Land from the far right, uh, he has this notion of a hyperstition, which is um, it's, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy of a superstition. Uh, computer science has an idea of a hypervisor, and I'm an aerospace engineer, and I like things that fly faster than Mach 5, so that's hypersonic. But the reference I'm most um, sort of uh, uh, inspired by is the idea of hyperbolic geometry. So here's the mnemonic image for those of you who don't know what it is. Regular geometry, which you learned in high school, happens on a plane. If you have a line and you pick a point outside it, there's only one line you can draw, draw through it. That's Euclidean geometry. And non-Euclidean geometries mess with the parallel postulate, and you get two basic versions. So if you have space-time that's positively curved, like the sphere on the top, you get a situation where there are no possible parallel lines. So the equivalent of a straight line in um, uh, a sphere is a great circle. And if you pick a point outside the great circle and try to draw another great circle that does not intersect the first one, it's not possible. So I like to think of that as a motif for there is no alternative. Whereas hyperbolic geometry on negatively curved spaces, if you have a straight line and then you pick a point outside it, you can draw an infinite number of other straight lines through it. So think of this as the motif for uh, hypercomplexity here. Okay, so why is hypercomplexity important? And I claim that hypercomplexity allows open-ended evolution. And it is the sort of substance of civilizational advances. Whereas the opposite, which is there is no alternative single monolithic states approaching perfection are a sign of evolutionary dead ends or bottlenecks. And my hypothesis is that history evolves when smooth Tina periods kind of trigger discontinuous hypercomplexity leaps. Uh, it's similar to the idea of punctuated equilibrium uh, biology. Okay, some justification since it's kind of like a wild big claim. So this is from Parkinson's law uh, management classic. And there's a lot of evidence for the idea that, um, you know, when a system approaches perfection, it's at the point of collapse. Perfection is finality, perfection is death. So a system approaching that state is about to collapse and die. I hope you can see some connections to things that were said earlier in the morning. And uh, Tim had this slide up yesterday, and yeah, it made me grit my teeth because it makes my talk a little harder. <laughs> And I just took this picture in the morning with Danny's talk, and I thought the headline was perfect. Perfect rhythm of finality and maybe perfection and collapse and death. I hope not. Okay, let's see if we can find a way out of that. So I love this definition of um, civilizational advances by the philosopher Whitehead. Um, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. So basically the idea is civilization is a series of automations of important things, okay? So maybe protocol perfection can also be a foundation for an ecosystem hypercomplexity leap. So that's sort of the wild speculative hypothesis here. Yeah, so a major op a category of important operations is basically dealing with conflict amongst mutually divergent narratives, right? Many stories are being told. How do you actually deal with conflict? An example is religions that compete for believers and promise different afterlives, right? And for thousands of years, we did not actually have a good way of dealing with this. And freedom of religion, you can think of it as a whitehead advance that automates this particular important operation. And in this conference of like 3,000 people, uh, some subset of you are in this room, I'm sure that many religions and many levels of sincerity and religious belief are represented, and there's a lot of atheists. But fundamentally, we sort of figured out about 300, 400 years ago what it takes for multiple religions to live in the same area without killing each other, right? So we've replaced religious wars with a kind of pluralist peace. 
an example, a list of examples of whitehead advances. So I've compiled this from a bunch of sources. <clears throat> you can see that at the bottom. Uh, the first three are from Fukuyama's uh, other book, really good, I strongly recommend it if you're interested in these topics, The Origins of Political Order. The first three are civilizational leaps that really allowed more and more divergent stories to live in the same region or nation or country, right? Strong centralized state, rule of law, which is a very different idea than rule by law. If they're just uh, laws, that's not enough. You need everybody to be under the law. Some people cannot be above the law. So that's rule of law. And China, even though it innovated a strong central state, it did not develop and still has not developed rule of law. It has rule by law. And that developed in Egypt, India, and later on through Europe, then accountable government. Forgiveness is an idea Hannah Arendt points out is uh, kind of a novel innovation that came out of Christianity. That took us from a regime of like vendetta filled stories of like, you know, killing each other in tit for tat stories to much more pluralist stories where maybe you didn't have to kill each other. Maybe forgiveness and uh, moving forward is a way. Separation of religion and state. This is a fairly recent idea. Spinoza in the 1670s actually had to kind of invent the idea and states had to kind of be developed on the basis of that. Modern markets, um, I strongly suggest you read Brad DeLong's new book that just came out, Slouching Towards Utopia. And of course, what we're talking about here, I think crypto is actually one such civilizational advance or leap. And I think there's another big contender in the world today, which is machine learning. And it's kind of interesting that we have do these two things. And I was tweeting a while ago that uh, maybe crypto is the first foundation and machine learning is the second foundation, like, you know, in Asimov's uh, psychohistory. Okay, so let's put all these things together. What's the connection between complexity, hypercomplexity, ossification, civilizational advances? Lots of big, vague terms. Let's start with complexity, and there's like lots and lots of different ways to think about complexity. I'm not going to be talking about all of these, but happy to like sidebar with anybody who's interested. I could talk for an hour on each of these. Um, all other technical ways, uh, these are all technical ways. There are social and humanities ways of thinking about complexity, but I'll go with technical. Um, and the one I want to like highlight for understanding our topic is one known as kinefin. It's pronounced kinefin. It's a Scottish word. It looks like sinefin, but it's kinefin. And it was developed by this guy, Dave Snowden. And this is the picture. It thinks of systems in the, um, within this framework of four regimes of clear, complicated, complex, and chaotic. And they're each described by a pattern of constraints and a pattern of how to operate effectively within them. So if you work backwards from chaotic, Chaotic systems lack all constraint and the bits and pieces are highly decoupled, which means you have like stories that can evolve that are like disconnected and mutually incommensurate, like I said. And the best way to act within them is kind of adventurously. So, you know, act, sense, respond. That's the phrase they use, which is kind of like living dangerously. You could die. Once you get to complex regimes, you have slightly loosely coupled system, so it's no longer decoupled, and you have a more experimental regime where you can do like, you know, trial and error and it won't always kill you and there's an opportunity to learn and evolve without killing yourself. Then you get to complicated where constraints start to get tightly coupled and you're in a sense analyze respond regime where think of it as you have to look at a situation, model it, analyze it, you know, with spreadsheets and equations and everything. And chances are if you think clearly and do it well, it actually won't require much trial and error or you know, killing yourself. And finally, clear, it's a completely constrained system. There are no degrees of freedom. There is no alternative. And all you can do is look at reality, sense it, categorize it, and respond. You're almost an automaton. You're a bot. OK, let's map this to everything we've talked about so far. So the whitehead definition of uh, civilization, I think, maps to the path from chaotic to clear. Right? You have a chaotic system. You add a little bit more thinking and advancing and it becomes a complex system where it's still hard to manage, then it becomes a complicated system. And then finally it becomes a clear system where it's been fully automated and you don't have to think about it anymore. And the right half of that kind of two by two is the there is no alternative regime, right? Complicated plus clear. That's what things that there are no alternative to look like. If you look at the neoliberal world order and the Washington consensus, World Bank's playbook, IMF's playbook, that looks like the part on the right. There is no alternative, it's a complicated and in some places clear thing. And of course, if you want to add the idea that towards perfection you get collapse, 
you have a leap, a red leap from clear to chaotic, where a system approaches perfection, acquires fragility, collapses, and then you're back in chaos, all right? So this is how I think of uh, hyper-complexity. This is the picture on which it evolves. So the question is, can we eliminate crisis pathways in this whole process of evolving hyper-complexity? Can we have smoothly increasing hyper-complexity without these, you know, there is no alternative bottlenecks? And my belief is no, you cannot. Maybe you guys think differently, but... All right. But can we at least reshape crisis pathways? So I went from green, but not quite red, so an orange pathway. I think of this as equivalent to the question, can you do the equivalent of Asimovian psychohistory? And my belief is, yeah, maybe you can do it. This is sort of a very janky work in progress definition. But the idea is if you respond to a looming crisis by tweaking the system at an axiomatic level somehow, maybe the big crisis becomes a small crisis or even a no crisis. And maybe because of that, you benefit by getting a period where hyper-complexity can grow, right? And examples are Y2K, a crisis that turned out not to be, the Montreal Protocol for ozone that worked pretty well. It's sort of like backsliding now and uh, ozone is back as a problem. Some types of corporate self-disruption seem to work like Netflix moving from you know, DVDs to streaming. The merge, I think I would still put a question mark on it. Has it actually hit the category of um, this definition? Same with a lot of things happening in say climate change like renewables or carbon capture. And note that this is not resilience or accelerationism, which are two other ways of thinking about this um, problem. Resilience is you make yourself tough enough and redundant enough that you can sort of power through the crisis and come out maybe a little broken and battered, but you're still alive. That's resilience. Accelerationism is you believe that the system today is so corrupt it deserves to die and you floor the accelerator and burst through the crisis and you come out the other side, maybe, you know, superhuman. And a lot of the accelerationists, uh, it started as a right-wing philosophy, now there's a left accelerationism as well. But this is neither resilience nor accelerationism. This is what I think of as exaptation. So, you know, adapting to something kind of before it happens. So this is where I think it maps to, this is another st uh, slide stolen from uh, Tim yesterday. So we had a candidate um, hyper-complexity leap starting. And before ossification, maybe we will enjoy a period of hyper-complexity growth. And that's a pretty blurry picture, but that's about as blurry as my understanding. So I'm fine with that. How do you design for this uh, process of like, you know, hopefully reshaped hyper-complexity evolution? So in search of design principles, you can think of like um, the spirit of the design principles first. So first thing I want to do is infer what hyper-complexity is like from historical examples, not theories. So the list of examples I looked at before, you know, like development of the state, the emergence of Christianity, things like that. It's not the t original Tina playbook of neoliberalism. It's not the Silicon Valley uh, playbook. Some of you may recognize uh, the phrase breaking smart. I wrote a set of essays uh, while working with Andreessen Horowitz about seven years ago, and that's the Silicon Valley playbook. I sincerely believe what we're entering now is no longer the Silicon Valley playbook. Uh, and of course, um, what all the other all Tina playbooks, the socialist one, the libertarian one, I think they're all kind of like not candidates here. So right now, I'm just thinking through the phenomenology that I think is important in hyper-complexity. It needs theorizing. And I added those last two points as I was listening this morning. I love the idea of subtraction over addition. And I was surprised to hear so many mentions of infinite game over finite game. I'm really pleased to hear that because James Cars is one of my favorite authors. And I had the good fortune to uh, be in a salon where he spoke uh, a few weeks before he died. So one of the last opportunities to hear him. And one of the interesting things was I had assumed he would be kind of this very spiritual, theological, philosoph uh, philosophical guy who would, um, I don't know, I had a certain picture in my head, but it turns out he's a jock. At one point in his life, he was an athlete, a football player, and it was really sort of like, you know, a narrative violation for me. But when he thinks about finite and infinite games, he literally comes from a background of real sports and games. And it's when we talk about like, you know, hyper games on top of Ethereum, you really should actually think about real games as well, not like an you know, abstract game theory. It's a starting point. So I've been sort of collecting, I've been thinking about these things for like several years. And those of you I've been talking to, you know that I can go on at length about several of these. So for example, mediocrity over excellence is one of the points that gets me in the most trouble. I've written a 12 part blog series about it. 
so if you want to argue with me, you're going to have to read that first. Um, I like this idea of like, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy and bureaucracy gets a bad name, but you know, you guys have things that sound extremely bureaucratic and that's a good thing. EIP 1234 or whatever. I love it. And I like the idea of bureaucracy over monarchs, messiahs, and mobs. And this principle, it's kind of like a port of an old IETF principle that says something like, uh, we don't believe in um, kings or democracy. We believe in rough consensus and running code. I think we need an update of that, and that might be a good one. Fat overlaid, I've written a bunch about it. I want to say a little bit about the seventh one, which is entangled fan outs over fuck you forks. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that here. but. The idea that, you know, became popular in the last 10 years, a good idea of, like, you know, exit over voice, it sort of went cancerous, and now everybody's, like, exiting from each other, and it's like, you know, F you, I'm going to create my own future over there. And I think that's gotten unhealthy, and really I love what I see in the Ethereum community. So yesterday in the R&D workshop, it was uh, a funny thing happened. They had the big room, and when the two breakout sessions started, there was this group on one end. I have a photo. I meant to put it in, but I couldn't at a fine time. But in one room, one end of the room, there was a bunch of people discussing some complex number theory. And in the other end, some really janky practical implementation stuff on software. And the room hadn't really been designed for that. So both started talking loudly, and then there was some crosstalk, and there was some joking, and then both started speaking very um, softly. And I think of that as, yeah, you're exploring many futures with like a fork of um, a garden of forking paths, but they're not like independent and exiting from each other. They're entangled. So I think of that as, you know, entangled uh, fan outs is um, the phrase I'm thinking of. So fan as in like, you know, uh, things diverging, not uh, fanatic. And uh, if you extrapolate that to the global level, you really kind of want to go towards planetary mutualism as opposed to, you know, sovereign individualism, which seems to be the uh, and maybe it's Bitcoin's influence, but sovereign in individualism seems to be the popular um, default philosophy in the crypto world. I think planetary mutualism is what it should be and what Ethereum should lean towards. A uh, bunch of others, happy to talk to anybody who's interested in any of these. Um, I could go on for hours about this. Uh, I have a couple of minutes left. I do want to acknowledge a bunch of people. So a lot of this thinking actually for the last couple of years, it's been happening at this group I belong to, the Yak Collective. We have a Monday morning distributed systems group that discusses kind of more technical uh, stuff and a Friday morning study group that talks about like, you know, online governance and social stuff. So if you're interested, please do join us. And I do want to like shout out to all the people I've listed there. So John, Miguel, Kay, Rafa, John, many others. So um, all the people who helped me not make a complete ass of myself as I was exploring these topics starting a couple of years ago. I have been around the Ethereum ecosystem as a lurker since the beginning, but I only really got into it a couple of years ago. And of course, thanks to uh, Tim and uh, Vitalik for a bunch of helpful conversations. So looks like I ended with a minute to spare. So thank you very much.